The Europeans were the masters of gunpowder, but they were not the creators of it. It is odd to think that, by the time Charlemagne was busy conquering Western Europe in the early 800s, alchemists some 8,000 kilometers away in Tang, China had invented a primitive formula for the volatile powder. Though the Chinese did not know it as gunpowder like we do today. The creation of gunpowder was made in the pursuit of an elixir of immortality and everlasting life, either that or to be used as a tool for, to transform one material into another. For centuries before the Tang, the Chinese had experimented with chemicals to bring about such a drug. Still, it took until the year 808 for someone to figure out that he needed 6 parts sulfur to 6 parts saltpeter to 1 part birthwort herb to properly create huoyao, or fire medicine. Yet, this fire medicine became the principal building block to create weapons of immense destruction and loss of life. Fire medicine created medieval flamethrowers that set alight siege towers, bombs that turned whole scores of men into ash, artillery cannons that tore apart wooden warships, and handguns that punched holes into even the most battle-hearted and war-ready soldier. The Europeans were the masters of gunpowder, but the Chinese, Koreans, and Japanese were no mere amateurs with it. To understand the impact that gunpowder weaponry had in China, Korea, and Japan, it is a good idea to see what warfare in these regions was like before its invention. For millennia before the invention of gunpowder, China was home to one of the most powerful militaries on earth. Extensive bureaucracies, taxation, agriculture, and industry, even during the time of Alexander and Hannibal, allowed various Chinese warring states to field armies that often numbered in the tens to hundreds of thousands. Chinese armies were usually made up of, of mostly infantry and little cavalry, and they relied on well-developed supply systems to carry out frequent sieges. An invading army did not focus on destroying the enemy army, but aimed to occupy as much land as possible. Chinese armies liked to use spears, bows, and especially crossbows. Much like early guns, crossbows were slow, but they had a powerful, lethal punch. The Tang were the first to discover a solution to the crossbow's timely reload, the volley. As Tang scholar Du Yu wrote, The crossbow is slow to load, and when battle is near, it cannot shoot more than one or two times, and so battle is not a straightforward thing for the crossbow. At the same time, without the crossbow, it is not beneficial to do battle. Crossbow units should be divided into teams that can concentrate their arrow shooting. Those in the center of the formation should load, while those on the outside of the formation should shoot. They take turns, revolving and returning, so that once they've loaded, they exit, and once they've shot, they enter. In this way, the sound of the crossbow will not cease, and the enemy will not harm us. Therefore, the Chinese were no strangers to using volley tactics, and the use of guns in later centuries could be seen as just an extension of using crossbows, but just with more bang. Thanks to deeply developed bureaucracies, the Chinese armies of the first millennium AD already resembled the armies of early modern Europe, minus the cannons and handguns. The Japanese and Koreans were also able to field armies numbering the tens of thousands, and both made great use of swords, spears, bows, and crossbows. Japan itself was a military dictatorship starting in the 12th century. Though there were emperors, he was only the emperor in name as the shogun had held all the power and allowed wealthy landowners called daimyos to control much of the land, and this system developed into feudalism. The daimyos employed private retainers known as samurai to protect their lands. Gunpowder weaponry truly began to flourish under the Song Dynasty, which rose in 960 from the power vacuum left by the collapse of the Tang Dynasty in 906. The Song once again allowed China to enter a golden age of te technology, economics, science, and culture. Song China was incredibly urbanized for the time, with about 10% of the population living in cities. The rich and developed trading networks of the Great China Plain allowed Song China to undergo an economic revolution. 
It is estimated that the song's production of iron around the year 1100 was roughly the same as what the entire continent of Europe was producing in the 1700s. In textile production, the song soared with, in with inventions like water-powered weavers, something that Europeans would also not have for several hundred years. The four great in inventions of China include the compass, paper, printing, and gunpowder. The song made great contributions to all four. The song adopted the magnetic compass and used it to establish an overseas trading networks as far as the Middle East. The practice of issuing paper banknotes was adopted from the Tang and became the standard. The song invented movable type printing, which allowed books to, to replace scrolls. And of course, gunpowder, which was no longer made as the result of, of experimentation and accident, but now made deliberately with the intent to kill. It is possible that the Tang already began to use gunpowder weapons before the song, as it is hinted that a commander by the name of Yang Xing Mi, while besieging a city, ordered his men to shoot off a machine to let fly fire and burn the Longshan Gate. This could mean that, the, that fire arrows were among the first gunpowder weapons. Early gunpowder weaponry truly began to mature into its fiery forms as the song created dedicated government policies to deal with the development and manufacture of gunpowder weapons. The song government encouraged experimentation, rewarding innovators like Feng Shishun and Tang Fu, who demonstrated new types of gunpowder arrows and protobombs. In 1002, Xi Pu presented his groundbreaking fireballs and gunpowder arrows. Going forward, Xi Pu was endorsed by the Song Emperor and his inventions spread throughout the Middle Kingdom. The Song made the production of gunpowder weapons an official armament policy, with the military protection complex in the, in the imperial capital city of Kaifeng. Many artisans and carpenters were hired to produce weapons. Song sources note that in 1083, for example, the Imperial Court sent 100,000 gunpowder arrows to one garrison and 250,000 to another. Despite this air of military superiority, it came as a surprise for both sides when, in the year 1127, the Jurchenists leapt down from the steps of the north and overran Kaifeng, imprisoned the Song Emperor Chinsung, and took most of China north of the Yangtze River. The Jurchen were only a nomadic and semi-pastoral people residing in Manchuria just a generation ago, but were now led by the brilliant and ambitious Akuta, a figure from the Wanyan clan. Only 12 years before, in 1115, Akuta had adopted a Chinese dynastic name, calling himself the Jin Emperor, and aimed to conquer the, the wealthy Song to, the, to his south. Despite this trans transformation, the Song still viewed the Jurchen as mere barbarians. Nonetheless, the Song gave the Jurchens, now called the Jin, everything they had. In 1126, when Jin forces attacked Kaifeng, they faced strong resistance. The city had robust defenses, including, including immense walls, a deep moat, and advanced fortifications such as bastions. The Song defenders had their deadly gunpowder weapons, including new thunderclap bombs. Made with bamboo and filled with, and filled with incendiary gunpowder, the expansion of, of heated air inside the bamboo caused the explosion. One witness wrote that, at night the thunderclap bombs were used, hitting the lines of the enemy well and throwing them into great confusion. Many fled, screaming in fright. The Jin initially withdrew after being paid off by the Song but returned months later with, imp with improved gunpowder weapons, likely learned from captured Song troops. In these subsequent battles, both sides extensively used gunpowder bombs. The Jin, armed with gunpowder arrows and catapults, prevailed. The Song forced to flee southward, established a new capital in Hangzhou. During the immense fighting, a precursor to the gun emerged, the Firelands. The Firelands was a long staff with, gun, with a gunpowder filled tube at the end. The tube spews out a long jet of fire for minutes at a time when ignited. 
the Firelands had its defining moment with the Siege of De'en in 1132, when Jin forces attacked the city. Chen Gui, a, a resourceful leader during the siege, made significant use of the Firelands. Taking advantage of the fact that the Sky Bridges had got stuck in the moat, Chen Gui and 60 men holding Fire Lances came out of the Western Gate and burned the Sky Bridges, using Fire Oxen to help in this, and in an instant it was all over. Hang struck camp and left. Not only was the Fire Lance used to burn down buildings during the siege and other battles in, in the decades after, but it was also used to burn and scare away enemy troops from getting too close. Naval innovation also occurred during the song Jin conflicts. In 1129, Song warships were, were mandated to have trebuchets or gunpowder bombs. During a naval battle in 1159, the Song commander ordered that gunpowder arrows be shot from all sides, and whenever they struck, flames and smoke froze up in swirls, setting fire to several hundred vessels. Getting into the 1200s, explosive bombs also matured. The iron bomb emerged around, around 1189, initially used in battle in 1221 during the Jin siege of Qizhou. One commander, Zhao Yurong, wrote that the barbaric enemy attacked the northwest tower with an unceasing flow of catapult projectiles from 13 catapults. Each catapult shot was followed by an iron firebomb, whose sound was like thunder. That day, the city soldiers in facing the catapult shots showed great courage as they maneuvered our own catapults, hindered by injuries from the iron fire bombs. Their heads, their eyes, their cheeks were, were exploded to bits, and only one half of the face was left. The unrelenting four week hail of bombs onto the city eventually allowed the Jin to scale the walls and pour into the city, hunting down and slaughtering every officer and soldier and man, woman, and child alike without mercy. While the Jin struck south at Song China, a powerful nemesis for all of Eurasia brewed amongst the cold and desolate Mongolian steppe just north of the Jin. Born in 1167, Temujin grew up, through war and cunning, to eventually unite the split Mongolian tribes in 1206, where his people gave him the title of Chinggis Khan. Universal ruler. In 1211, Temujin initiated his first invasion of the Jin. He struck at the Jin capital of Zhangju, located today in Beijing, and before the year 1215 was over, the city was razed and plundered by the Mongols. The Jin Emperor fled to the old Song capital of Kaifeng, and the Mongols followed close behind. Temujin then died in 1227, succeeded by his son Ogade. The Mongols quickly adopted gunpowder weapons for use in 1232 for the siege of Kaifeng. The Mongols built extensive fortifications using Chinese captives for labor. They began employing gunpowder bombs, causing intense attacks on the city walls. The Jin defenders retaliated with their own gunpowder bombs called Heaven Shaking Thunder Bombs, which were iron vessels filled with gunpowder. These bombs were highly destructive and feared by Mongol soldiers. The siege lasted a year, resulting in widespread starvation and the capitulation of Kaifeng, the suicide of the Jin Emperor, and the absorption of the north of China into, into the quickly expanding Mongol Empire. The Mongols did not stop with the Jin and pressed on southward, with a several decade long war to conquer the rest of the Middle Kingdom. Gunpowder weapons played a crucial role, and gunpowder technology was evolving rapidly, and arsenals played a significant role in the war effort. In 1268, the Mongol seats of Shangyong and Fansheng involved intense fighting, with gunpowder weapons on both sides. The siege of the two cities lasted until 1273, followed by reprisals and mass murder of the defendants and the unfortunate citizens. The sieges of Shangyang and Changzhou in 1275 saw similar scenes. The Song continued to resist with gunpowder weapons, hopelessly, but with, his, but with intense bravery. The Song resorted to desperate and selfless measures to stave off the invaders, like in 1276, when the defenders in Jingzheng 
bird cleared in the Mongols and blew themselves up. The noise was, was like a tremendous thunder, thunderclap shaking the walls and ground and the smoke filled up the heavens outside. Many of the troops outside were startled to death. When the fire was extinguished, they went in to see. There was just ashes, not a trace left. The collapse of the song was to come any day now, and when the last heir to the song throne, the young six-year-old Bing was drowned by his guardians in 1279 to avoid Mongol capture, Kublai Khan's Yuan Dynasty now solely controlled China. The Song Mongol Wars saw their fair share of bombs, fire lances, and other gunpowder weapons, but notably, the most significant development in the Song Mongol Wars was the birth of the gun. A gun is a device that propels a projectile using the expanding gas from a gunpowder reaction. The efficiency of a gun depends on how much gas can push the projectile, known as windage. A true gun has a bullet fitting the barrel. In the late 1100s and 1200s, fire lances evolved into many various weapons with sparks, flames, and ceramics. The Book of the Fire Dragon from the Ming period describes these as eruptors. They had unique names like the Filling the Sky Erupting Tube and the Phalanx Charging Fire Gourd. During the Song Mongol Wars, fire lances were widely used by both sides. The Song developed fire emitting lances, which were made from a large bamboo tube, and inside is stuffed with a pellet wad. Once the fire goes off, it completely spews the rear pellet wad forth and the sound is like a bomb that can be heard for, five, for 500 or more paces. The transition from bamboo-barreled to metal-barreled guns occurred after the Mongols defeated the Song and established the Yuan Dynasty in 1279. The Xanadu gun, dating back to 1298, is the oldest extant gun. Archaeological finds, like a bronze gun in Gansu province, suggest that the Shisha a country and people who lived in the era in, in the early 1200s also made metal proto guns. The Mongols, after defeating the Song, went on to invade various regions like, like Japan, Vietnam, Myanmar, and Indonesia, leading to more gunpowder innovation and dissemination. As the Yuan dynasty dissolved in the 1350s, guns played a crucial role in the ensuing wars. Zhu Yuan Zhang, a Buddhist monk, established the Ming Dynasty in the place of the Yuan, which may very well be the, the world's first gunpowder empire. When Zhu Yuanzhang overthrew the Yuan and established the Ming Dynasty in 1368, he proclaimed it as the era of Hongwu, meaning Great Martiality or Most Warlike. This title aptly reflected his reign as it was marked by victorious battles and the expulsion of the Mongols from China. Huang Wu, however, continued to lead wars in various directions, facing challenges from powerful enemies in Sichuan and Yunnan. The Ming Dynasty's remarkable success was attributed to their, to their effective use of firearms, particularly guns. By 1380, Ming policies mandated that 10% of soldiers should be gunners. When you note that the Ming army numbered somewhere below 2 million men, this meant that as many as 180,000 troops used guns. This number becomes more impressive when you consider that this outnumbers the combined knights, soldiers, and pages in, in France, England, and Burgundy during the same time. As time went on, the percentage of gunners increased, reaching 30% by 1466. Hong Wu ex established specialized bureaus for arms production, such as the Bureau of Armaments and the Military Armory Bureau, which was tasked with creating diverse types of guns and weapons. The Ming Dynasty's arms industry, overseen by Hong Wu, became the world's largest and most advanced. The Ming Dynasty in China started using guns right from the very beginning. One significant event was the naval battle at Lake Poyang in 1363. 
This battle is important for being one of the largest in world history, involving hundreds of ships and around 500,000 troops. Lake Poyang was crucial because it connected the Yangtze River with other rivers. The fight was between Zhou Yuanzhang and Nanjing Chang Liung, a, war a warlord from the state of Han. Chang wanted control of China while the Yuan dynasty was collapsing, and he aimed to capture Nanjing, a key city guarding Lake, Lake Poyang's southern approach. Chang's invasion force was, a was substantial, with hundreds of vessels including special tower ships for river assaults. These ships had iron-sided towers and were not used for ship-to-ship -ship -ship combat, but instead for reaching cities along rivers. In June 1363, Chang attacked Nanchang, but the Ming defenders, led by Zhu Yuanzhang's nephew, Zhu Wenzhang, re repelled the assault with firearms. Unable to capture Nanchang, Chang surrounded the city trying to starve the defenders into surrender. However, a small fishing boat broke through enemy lines, reached Nanjing, and alerted Zhu Yuanzhang. In response, Zhu repair repaired a fleet and faced Chen's larger fleet on Lake Poyang on August 29th. Despite being outnumbered, Zhu's forces won. This battle is significant in gunpowder history, showcasing the Ming's early use of various gunpowder weapons, including fire bombs, fire guns, fire arrows, fire seeds, large and small fire lances, large and small commander fire tubes, commander and small iron bombs, and rockets. In later sieges, like the 1366 Siege of Suizhou, guns also played a role but were mainly used against individuals, not the city walls. The attackers used, used trebuchets and other siege weapons to attack the structures and gates. The siege of Suizhou lasted 10 months, with food shortages weakening the defenders. General Shou Da breached the city's gates, leading to its fall. The Ming Dynasty's guns were mainly used for man-to-man -man fighting and were small in their size, weighing to 2 to 3 kilograms. Even large guns were only around 75 kilograms. Cannons were usually less than 80 kilograms, but this does not mean that the Ming were incapable of making anything bigger. However, a trio of cannons made in 1377 measured a meter long with a muzzle diameter of 21 centimeters. At the same time, big cannons in Western Europe were massive, weighing tons, not just kilograms. They could shoot heavy balls that weighed hundreds of kilograms. One account of the bombards used at the town of Odenard in 1382 says that one could hear it for 5 leagues in the daytime and 10 leagues at night, and it made such a huge noise that it seems as though all the demons of hell were present. During the Hundred Years' War, the Dukes of Burgundy and the Kings of England and France started using guns and artillery. By the 1400s, they were regularly wrecking the enemy's walls with just a couple of shots. The Western Europeans at the time were not the only ones experimenting with large gunpowder cannons. The Ottoman Empire also had powerful cannons. They used them to conquer Constantinople in 1453, even though the city had very strong defenses. Sultan Mehmed II got a skilled cannon maker named Urban to build a massive cannon who promised Mehmed that, it, that they could bring down Constantinople's walls. Urban spent three months making a cannon described as a terrible and unprecedented monster that was 20 to 30 feet long. The cannon required enormous amounts of powder to fire specially formed stone balls weighing between 1200 and 1800 pounds. Combined with other cannons, Constantinople's walls were destroyed in under two months. In the final assault, Mehmed's forces stormed the breaches, leading to the fall of the city, and with it, the fall of the Roman Empire. So, despite being its birthplace, why were Chinese guns much, much smaller? As the historian in Sydney Toy put it, in China, their principal towns were, are surrounded to the present day by walls so substantial, lofty, and formidable that the medieval fortifications of Europe are puny in comparison. Chinese walls were thick, well made, and widespread, making it harder for early guns even big European ones, to attack them. In comparison, 
European walls were generally thinner. The Romans were good at building walls, but even theirs were not as thick. Roman walls were about 1.5 to 2.5 meters wide at their base, while Chinese ones measured 20 meters. During the Middle Ages, many European towns did not have walls, and those that did were usually, were usually thinner compared to Chinese cities. The difference in wall thickness and construction material made European walls vulnerable to artillery. European walls were made of stone, while Chinese walls had a tampered earth core, which absorbed the shock of the artillery's energy. Chinese walls were also sloped, deflecting projectiles and absorbing less impact force. As Europeans adapted to resist artillery, they started to build building walls like the Chinese, sloped with stone, stone on the outside and thicker. They, this made it tough for artillery to reach, leading to longer sieges because the garrisons no longer surrendered easily after a few cannibal breaches. European artillery was good at breaching walls, but it was expensive. Big guns needed a lot of money for production, transportation, and ammo. European rulers thought it was worth it because they believed their artillery could break the enemy walls or scare garrisons into, into surrender. In China, the strong and well-built walls discouraged the need to, to, to develop gunpowder artillery, as any weapon able to knock them down would be too big and too expensive. In the early 1500s, China had its first war with the Europeans in the two Sino-Portuguese wars. The first one was in 1521, and the second in 1522. The first clash took place near Guangzhou, where Portuguese diplomats had come in 1517. There were problems with communication and accusations of bad behavior from the Portuguese, which made relations tense. In 1521, the situation escalated when Portuguese ships did not follow orders to leave, leading to conflicts with the, with the Chinese fleet led by Wang Hong. The Portuguese did well in the first fight because they had better weapons. Even though Wang Hong had more soldiers, it, it did not help him win. Wang Hong realized that Portugal's guns were better and mentioned it in writing. The ferociousness of the Portuguese depends on these guns alone. Since ancient times, no weapons have ever surpassed these powerful and violent ones. In 1522, the Portuguese sent Admiral Martin Alfonso de Melo to re-establish friendly relations with the Ming. When he sailed to Guangzhou, he came across a big Chinese fleet led by Admirals Ke Rong and Wang Ying Eng. According to de Melo, the Chinese fleet seemed in total to be more than 300 sails, large and small, and 80 of them were very large chunks of two masts very well armed with small artillery and many other of, of the weapons they have. The Chinese fleet, armed with a superior firepower, overwhelmed the Portuguese, resulting in a devastating defeat. I saw one of the vessels burst into flames and go down to the bottom with nothing left alive or dead that we can see, and it was my brother Diogo de Melo's vessel, and with him went 15 or 20 members of my father's household, and of mine, who had gone with him. The Chinese probably picked up a thing or two from the first meeting and started using Portugal's Western-style guns. The two wars led to China learning new military tactics and getting foreign technology. Wang Hong and others in charge thought it was a good idea to keep using these foreign weapons. During this period, Europeans were busy making guns and cannons better. Around the late 1400s, Guns started to have having long barrels and having a new firing mechanism called a matchlock. With the matchlock, a burning fuse could be easily moved in with a finger to ignite a gunpowder in a flash pan. This allowed soldiers to aim at eye level and shoot accurately. As time went on, triggers got better and guns became easier to handle. By the late 1500s, guns became a big part of European armies, making up to 40% of infantry forces. These new guns, called muskets or arquebuses, were widely adopted, especially in Japan. According to the traveler Fernão Mendes Pinto, he and two Portuguese sailors ended up in Japan in 1543 after their ship was attacked by pirates and caught in a huge storm. 
One of the Portuguese, Diogo Zimoto, was good with the arquebus, shooting 26 ducks back to back. The local Japanese lord, Tangashima Tokiaki, was so amazed that he had the gun copied. The effect thereof, wrote Mendes Pinto, was such that before our departure, which was five months and a half after, there were 600 of them made in the country. Japanese sources confirm that the Portuguese arrived in 1453, demonstrating their guns on Tangashima Island. A small white tiger was set up on a bank. The man gripped the object with one hand, strengthened his posture, and squinted with one eye. When thereupon fire issued from the opening, the pal always hit the target squarely. All spy standards covered their ears. Two Portuguese guns were purchased at high prices, and Japanese smiths studied them carefully. Through months and over seasons, they worked with the objective of producing a new gun, and eventually, with help from a foreign blacksmith who had arrived or by chance on another ship, the technique was mastered. Kyushu, where the Portuguese ships came by, was at first the only place where guns could be made in Japan. After a while, blacksmiths from the mainland, Honshu, also went to Kyushu to learn how to make these new weapons. Skilled gunsmiths started schools, and the other gunsmiths who learned from them opened shops all over Japan, even in faraway villages. By 1556, a little over a decade since the Portuguese first arrived in Japan, there were over 300,000 guns in the archipelago. By the time of the Portuguese arrival, the political situation in Japan, in Japan had been declining. Though there was the emperor, the shogun, now led by the Ashikaga clan, and the daimyos. The many daimyos were now divided and interlocked in the Sengoku Jidai, the Wang State period, a time of constant battles for control. This chaos started in the, with the Onin War from 1467 to 1477. This civil war caused hardship for many ordinary people, and even though it ended in 1477, Japan continued to have problems with war and rivalries into the late 16th century. It is in this chaotic scene that Oda Nobunaga shows up. Born in 1534, Nobunaga was a tough leader from a young age. By 1549, at just 15 years old, he had already commanded 500 soldiers with their own guns. When he inherited Nagoya Castle in 1551, he now had a starting point to take over all of Japan. Nobunaga and his ally, Tokugawa Ieyasu, won battle after battle. In 1568, he took over Kyoto, the capital of the Ashikaga Shogunate, and put Ashikaga Yoshiaki as his puppet ruler. But five years later, Yoshiaki was banished for working with Nobunaga's enemies. This ended the Ashikaga Shogunate and, and began the Azushi Momoyama period. One of his enemies, the Takeda clan, attacked Nagashino Castle in 1575 with 15,000 soldiers. The leader of the, of the Takeda clan, Katsuri, however, had way fewer soldiers than Nobunaga's force of 38,000 soldiers, including 3,000 musketeers. In the early morning of June 29th, Katsuyori got trapped by Nobunaga's army and was forced to charge his cavalry at Nobunaga's soldiers. Nobunaga's 3,000 musketeers were behind him with tall wooden fences. Nobunaga used rotating ranks of musketeers to create a, a continuous volley of fire. The result was a crushing defeat for the Takeda clan. The Battle of Nagashino is a, is a key battle in the development of gunpowder weaponry in East Asia, as, after the battle, the use of handguns in Japan spread rapidly. By the time of Nobunaga's death in 1582, Around one third of the soldiers in the armies of most of the leading gambos were musketeers. From the 1540s to the 1560s, pirates in East Asia, made up of motley crews of Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, Thai, and others, were active along Ming China's coast. They shared ideas and technologies with each other. Though pirates did not really use muskets, they were there, few and far between. Ming China noticed this and, by 1549, started using muskets against pirates. Over time, they became more interested, making thousands of muskets by 1558, easily outgunning the pirates. Qi Ji Guang, a notable Ming military leader, embraced the musket despite his focus on traditional weapons. 
After facing defeat from Japanese pirates, he saw the power of musketry and quickly became a supporter of it. It is unlike any other of the many types of fire weapons. In strength, it can pierce armor. In accuracy, it can strike the center of targets, even to the point of hitting the eye of a coin. And not just for exceptional shooters. The arquebus is such a powerful weapon and is so accurate that even bow and arrow cannot match it. And nothing is so strong as to be able to defend against it. Chi Ji Guang organizes soldiers into groups of 12, stressing the importance of training and being disciplined. He taught them the techniques like the counter march technique and volley fire. His soldiers learned how to load and shoot in a well coordinated way, making them efficient in battles. Ji was, was practical in his training approach, focusing on practically using firearms. He broke down the process of loading and shooting into, into specific steps. He even made a song for soldiers to sing while loading their guns to keep a steady rhythm. His manner of change to measure their gun powder ahead of time for quick loading. He had regular reviews, tests, and inspections to stay skilled. Ji's influence reached beyond China, especially in East Asia. His emphasis on, dis on disciplined training and using guns effectively especially had a big impact on military tactics in Korea. Korea is not a country that is often thought for for its gunpowder weaponry, as it is small when compared to its neighbors, China and Japan. But you may be surprised to know that it had one of the most advanced musket-based armies in the world for its time. Korea can give thanks to this prowess to the Imjin War, Japan's invasion of the peninsula in 1592. Toyotori Hideyoshi became the most powerful figure in Japan after he inherited the lands, wealth, and power of his, of his superior, Oda Nobunaga, when he died in 1582. Nobunaga left Hideyoshi a mostly unified Japan. With unceasing, almost dangerous ambition, Hideyoshi wanted to, to take this newfound power and build an empire. He was going to invade China. But first, he needed to control Korea. The peninsula functioned as a literal stepping stone to the Middle Kingdom, and, and it functioned as the gates to the main ca capital of Beijing. Hideyoshi gathered a huge army of 158,000 soldiers and a navy of 9,200 sailors. In April 1592, they landed in Korea, captured the city of Busan, and defeated the Korean army at the Battle of Chunju. They took Seoul on June 12th. The Koreans were surprised, and their king fled. The Japanese began to prepare to invade China. Japan can easily credit its early successes to its 50-year head start with musketry. Korea did not employ as much gunpowder weaponry, unlike Japan. Despite this, the Koreans did have guns even before they got muskets in the, uh, in the late 1500s. Some guns came from China, but Koreans also made their own using gunpowder. By 1447, Koreans were using a volley technique with guns. However, the Koreans preferred using archers on the field and cannons on their ships. After capturing Seoul, the Japanese forces split into three, capturing Pyongyang in July and the northern frontier with Manchuria. However, they faced a roadblock from the Korean Navy, led by the gifted Admiral Yi Sun Sin. The Koreans had only a handful of special Gyeopungseon, or turtle ships, that were hard to attack. Their decks were, pla were plated in iron and covered in spikes, which made it very hard to board an attack. Yi Sun Sin was able to win several naval battles, blocking the Japanese from supporting their armies in the north. Logistics became a problem for the Japanese, forcing them to switch from preparing to invade China to occupying Korea. With supplies dwindling, Hideyoshi began a harsh occupation. Rice and other foodstuffs were confiscated, and cultural treasures were ruthlessly looted. The Korean people themselves were targeted, with whole villages kidnapped and sold into slavery in Japan. Looking to prevent a possible leg legitimate invasion of his realm, the Ming Emperor Wan Li sent help to Korea in the form of a token force, and after some initial setbacks, a larger Ming army of 50,000 arrived and defeated the Japanese at Pyongyang in early 1593. The Ming were able to negotiate an armistice, and the Japanese re retreated to Seoul, but still occupied the southern half of Korea. 
the resulting peace negotiations had mixed signals. Chinese negotiators told the Ming that Hideyoshi was, would accept the, the title of King of Japan and thus become a tributary of Ming China. Japanese negotiators delivered Hideyoshi's demands, which was a marriage between the Emperor of Japan and the daughter of, of Ming Emperor Wanli, as well as Southern Korea to, to be annexed. When these negotiations stalled, Hideyoshi sent another army of 100,000 men to invade Korea again in the August of 1597. But this time, things did not go so well for Japan. The Koreans were ready to, for another invasion, and China already had an army in Korea, and Yi Sun Sin still ruled the waters around the peninsula. The Korean people began to fight back with guerrilla fighters, branded as righteous armies. It seemed impossible for Japan to control Korea or get into China. Then the Japanese war effort came to a screeching halt when Hideyoshi died in September 1598, and an armistice was agreed upon and the invasion was called off. But even during the ceasefire, many Japanese soldiers had to fight their way out of Korea. In the chaos, Yi Sun Sin was killed by a lucky bullet. During the six year struggle, at least 125,000 Koreans died. The Japanese samurai were told to take ears, heads, and noses from Korean soldiers and people as trophies. In just one year, 1598, over 38,000 Koreans suffered like this. Japan sold about 100,000 Koreans to the Portuguese as slaves. Seoul, the Korean capital city, was left in ruin. After the war, only 100,000 out of the 400,000 people still lived in the city. After Hideyoshi died, Tokugawa Ieyasu took control and began the Tokugawa Shogunate. This started the Edo period in Japan, a 265 year long era of internal peace, growth, stability, and isolation from the outside world. Because of the horrible, horrible trauma from the war, Korea reformed its military a lot. These changes focused on using muskets. King Seonjo, who ruled from 1567 to 1608, really liked muskets and he ordered the, that Japanese musketeers that were to be captured to teach Koreans. He also made it a standing army called the Military Training Agency with musketeers at its core. The Korean musketeers were trained in a volley technique inspired by Chi Ji Kwon's methods. Military manuals from 1607 and 1649 detailed the use of musketeers in volleys against oncoming enemies, filling gaps in Chi Ji Kwon's work. The Imjin War made China's economic situation nosedive, but even before that, China was already having problems with its government. It all started when Zhou Yujin, only 10 years old, became the Wanli Emperor in 1572. At first, things went well because he had good advisors to lean on, but when Wanli st stopped taking care of court affairs in 1582, different factions started fighting for power, and the government got weaker. Wanli's reliance on eunuchs for communication led to corruption, as officials bribed them to reach the emperor. These eunuchs, who were not supposed to be involved in politics, started to have a lot of influence during Wanli's rule. They started doing important administrative jobs, and even started collecting taxes. Some eunuchs abused their power, making things unstable and corrupt. Spain's efforts to stop the illegal silver trade with China led to a shortage of silver in China, which made things even harder. People started hoarding silver, so the changing value of copper to silver exchanges made it harder for peasants to pay taxes. It did not help that the Ming had switched from, a, from the traditional hereditary soldier system to a paid volunteer system, which was more expensive. Natural disasters like famines and floods also made everything even more difficult for the government. Peasant revolts broke out in the early 1630s. Yi Sheng led one of these rebellions and promised to get rid of taxes and change how land was owned. Many people were unhappy with being poor and paying high taxes, so Li Sheng easily took over large sections of China and started the Shen Dynasty. At the same time, 
Another rebellion led by Zhang Xianzhong caused a lot of damage in Sichuan. The Changzhen em Emperor, who inherited the Ming Dynasty in 1627, killed himself when Li Zhexiang's soldiers took over the capital in 1644. To get help, Ming officials asked the Jurchen in central Manchuria, east of Mongolia. The Jurchen used to rule northern China during the Jin Dynasty during the Southern Song, but since then they had split into different groups. These Jurchen groups gave tribute to the Ming. Nurhachi, a Jurchen leader of the Aisinguro clan, brought the Jurchen together in 1616 and called it the Later Jin and broke their loyalty to the Ming. He proclaimed his seven grievances, which explained how the Ming had mistreated him and his clan. This acted as a de facto declaration of war between his Jurchen tribes and the Ming. The Jurchen initially lacked the numbers to push farther south, but over the following years, they developed a large diverse army, organized in the Eight Banner System, and encouraged many ethnic ethnicities into their ranks. However, the Ming was still largely able to hold off the invasion thanks to the gunpowder technology and the Great Wall. So, the fighting continued for over 20 years. The Georgian had strengthened their position north of the wall considerably in 1636 when they finally invaded Korea, also a Ming tributary state, and forced them to submit to the rule. When Beijing fell in 1644, the Jurchens, unlike the Chinese rebels, had a strong government outside the Great Wall. A Ming general, Wu Sangai, opened a wall for the Jurchens, now named Manchus, in the hope that they would crush the rebels. The Manchus, now under, under the leadership of the young Sun Ji, defeated the Shun at Shanghai Pass and quickly captured Beijing, forcing the Shun to retreat to Xi'an in the west while the Manchu established their own, own dynasty, the Qing. The Ming had planned to use the Qing as auxiliary troops, but it became clear that the Qing were staying for good. The Ming government, what was left of it after the fall of Beijing, ran away to Nanjing. In June, they made Zhou Yuzong the Hongwang Emperor, starting the Southern Ming period. He tried to th make things better in the south and recover the north, but there was internal conflicts. The Ming suffered from crop failures, and their own unpaid, discontent armies pillaged the countryside. The armies that were kept under control were corrupt and unwilling to fight. The Manchu army was rapidly approaching. The towns of Yangzhou, Suizhou, and Hangzhou fell by May 1645, and hundreds of thousands were slaughtered in the process. In June, Nanjing fell, and Zhu Yusong was caught and killed. Then, the Longwu Emperor, Zhou Yuzhian, made himself emperor in Fuzhou in August with help from loyal officials. Longwu had the help of Zhang Jilong, a former pri pirate who commanded a large army and navy. Sensing the near end of the Ming, Zhang Jilong defected to the Qing, allowing them to take Fuzhou and the Longwu Emperor in October 1646. In Guangzhou, Zhu Yuye was declared the Xiao Wu Emperor, but the Qing caught him and quickly killed him. At the same time in Jiaoqing, Zhu Yulang called himself the Yongli Emperor. Though they won battles in some places, things got worse overall. In 1658, the Qing took Yunnan, and the Yongli Emperor ran away to northern Myanmar. Yongli, the last Ming Emperor, died in the summer of 1662 chased down by Qing forces and strangled. The final Ming loyalist stronghold, however, lay on the island of Taiwan. The island of Taiwan has so far proven to be a valuable jewel for the Dutch colonial empire. In 1661, the son of Zhang Jilong, Chang Chang Gong, better known as Konchinga, invaded the island to establish a secure foothold to retake, to retake mainland China. Koshinga targeted a fort called, called Fort Zealandia, which was built to protect the entrance to the Bay of Taoyong in Taiwan. The fort was located on a long, narrow piece of land that jutted out into the bay, with cannons sticking out over the water. Instead of trying to, to face the powerful guns of, of Zealandia, Koshinga used a clever move. 
He waited for high tide and went a different way, avoiding the dangerous waters. Koshinga and his soldiers landed, placing themselves strategically in the sand dunes near the fort in a nearby town. Koshinga felt well sure of himself because his army was much bigger than the Dutch, and Zealandia wasn't that big. He thought he could win by attacking with cannons and storming the fort, but the Dutch weren't scared. Koshinga got ready and, during the night, he attacked. At first, it worked, but the Dutch adjusted by moving their cannons and guns, using the fort's structure to protect themselves. Koshinga's guns were shot at in silence, and many of his soldiers were killed. The Dutch governor wrote, With the first charge, nearly the whole field was strewn with, with dead and wounded, the enemy being thus taught the lesson not to expose themselves so readily. Realizing that he couldn't win easily, Koshinga knew he had to capture the fort. After some field attempts, a lucky break came when a German trader helped design effective defenses. These protected Koshinga's cannons from the Dutch attacks and successfully targeted an important Dutch defense point. The Dutch governor had no choice but to surrender. After nine months of fighting, Koshinga kicked the Dutch out of the island. Koshinga and his family ruled Taiwan until 1683 when the Qing invaded. Even though the shift from the Ming Dynasty to the Qing was devastating, with about 25 million people dying, the Qing managed to control the rebellions and expand their rule into Central Asia and Tibet. The Qing Dynasty was at its best during the time of the, Ch of the Qianlong Emperor in the late 1700s. Wars had pushed their borders so far from China's center that it made outside threats minimal. They had hegemony over East Asia, and a relatively peaceful one too. Because of this, the leaders of the Qing military didn't see a need to come up with new ideas or use new methods and technologies from outside East Asia. Even though they could get new stuff from the rest of the world, they didn't want to use them because they, had, they did not need to. So, their military got worse. In 1836, a British report said that China's military wasn't ready for a war. Garrison, garrison troops were undressed, unarmed, and unprepared. Chinese swords were rusty, and soldiers struggled to draw them. Qing infantry, up to 70% of them, used traditional weapons like long lances, side swords, bows, and rattan shields, with the rest using outdated, slow, and dangerous gunpowder weapons. Their matchlock musket design had not changed much since the 17th century, while European armies switched to more advanced flintlock firearms. The British at this time were already upgrading from flintlocks to the percussion caps mechanism. Qing commanders favored bows due to cultural reasons, and using firearms were sometimes restricted within the military. The Qing's military problems extended beyond outdated weapons and into ineffective drill practices. By the early 19th century, China's drill tradition had deteriorated, with ritualistic exercises little to do with actual warfare. The report concluded as such. We have now gone through the subject which we sat down to discuss, and although we were well aware that the military force of the Chinese Emperor was much overrated, we rise astounded at the weakness, the utter imbecility. It seems indeed strange that the whole fabric does not fall asunder of itself. Of this, we are convinced that, at the first vigorous and well-directed blow from a foreign power, it will totter to its base. The backwardness of the Qing army was highlighted to the rest of the world when it was put up against a more technologically advanced force, that being the British military during the First Opium War. The First Opium War happened because China tried to stop the opium trade. British traders had been illegally selling opium from India to China since the 1700s. This caused a lot of people in China to become addicted. In 1839, the Chinese government took and destroyed over 20,000 chests, or 1,400 tons, of opium held by British merchants in Guangzhou. Tensions rose in July when some drunk British sailors killed a Chinese villager. 
the British government didn't want their sailors to be judged by China's legal system, so they didn't hand them over to Chinese courts, making the situation even more tense. In November 1839, two British ships, the HMS Wallage and the HMS Hyacinth, armed with carronades, which had short barrels but fired large calibers, encountered and fought against a Chinese fleet near Guangzhou. Their British ships, with their fast firing carronades, caused a lot of damage to the Chinese fleet. The Chinese ships had old style cannons that were slower to aim and load compared to the British carronades, so they couldn't shoot as quickly. After that, the British sent soldiers to take over China's coastal cities. In October 1841, they took the city of Ningbo, and in March 1842, the Chinese started tried to take it back. However, the Chinese were at a disadvantage because of their old-fashioned weapons. Only a hundred British soldiers, armed with muskets, four field pieces, and a howitzer, fired at the advancing Chinese. The slaughter was quite horrible. The mangled bodies lay in huge piles, heaped one upon another. Another account notes that the howitzer only discontinued its fire from the impossibility of directing shot upon a living foe, clear of the writhing and shrieking hecatomb which it had already piled up. Another advantage for the British was that they were good at both making weapons and understanding how they worked. They spent a lot on teaching their military, especially in, in schools, for using artillery. The British were great at figuring out accurate calculations for, for trajectories and timing, which helped their, with their effectiveness in battle. After the British took over Nanjing in August, peace was made. In the Treaty of Nanjing that came out of it, the Qing had to give reparations, $21 million over four years, to Britain, hand over Hong Kong Island, and let the British trade and live in more parts of China. After the embarrassing treaty, the Qing dynasty realized they, need, they needed to make their army more modern and like the Western ones. Their problem was, at first, they didn't have the right plans and tools to do so. During the First Opium War, the Chinese tried to copy Western ships and cannons, but they still struggled to keep up with British military technology. In the 1860s, they started the self-strengthening movement to modernize all of China. The focus was on making the military stronger, building weapons, and, and improving the navy, but there were some issues. Different people, such as Zheng Guangfang and Li Hongzhang, set up military factories and shipyards in different places. Their problem was that they didn't work with, well together or with the central government. The government supported these projects, but they were not efficient and were biased. Many people in charge got their jobs simply because of personal connections. It also cost the Qing government a lot of money. For example, Li Hongzhang wanted a specific type of rifle, the breech-loading Remington rifle, to be made in his factories. But it ended up being expensive and not as good as the imported ones. The shipbuilding efforts were also disappointing, costing a lot to ultimately make ships that were more expensive than those from Britain. The program relied a lot on foreign help and materials, which made it even more expensive. There was also a lack of awareness about whether foreign workers were skilled enough. Corruption in construction contracts and worker wages also added to the rising cost. In Japan, the family of Tokugawa Ieyasu ruled the islands as shoguns of the Tokugawa shogunate. Similar to the Qing, the Tokugawa had control over their local area, and except for two rebellions in 1637 and 1837, Japan didn't have war for about 250 years. Tokugawa Ieyasu made a rule to keep Japan isolated from other countries. Only a small Dutch outpost in Nagasaki was allowed, and there were restrictions on visitors from China and Korea. Ieyasu's family kept following these rules until the mid-1800s. Contrary to what many people think, the Japanese didn't give up the gun. They kept having and making them during the Tokugawa period. Different schools taught how to use guns and make them. Local lords had to give soldiers guns based on how much land they controlled. Sometimes, there were rules against common people having weapons, 
but they weren't always enforced. Even though there was peace, guns were still around, used by both officials and regular people. Like the Qing, there weren't as many new innovations happening with guns in Japan because there wasn't a big need for them in wars. In the Tokugawa period, people started using guns more for sports, and not many new types of guns were made. In 1853, the Tokugawa Shogunate was given a rude awakening when American warships, led by Commander Matthew C. Perry, showed up in Uraga Bay. Perry wanted Japan to trade with the world after 220 years of staying closed off. The Tokugawa, realizing that they were weaker, signed unfair treaties like the Treaty of Kanagawa and the Harris Treaty. These treaties allowed American merchants into Japanese ports making people question the shogun's loyalty to, to the emperor. To get support, the shogun asked the daimyo for help, but they didn't like dealing with foreigners. People started wanting to follow the emperor more and kick out the outsiders. By the 1860s, the Tokugawa shogunate was in big trouble. Samurai were unhappy, and revolts in places like Chozu and Satsuma got worse. Chozu was anti-foreign leaders, joined forces with Satsuma against the Tokugawa. The shogun's armies tried to control Chozu but failed, making the shogun even weaker. The last shogun, Yoshinobu, had to give up power in 1867 and the Meiji Emperor was restored to full power. The emperor moved the capital from Kyoto to Edo, now called Tokyo, and Japan started becoming a modern country. The new Meiji government led by people from Satsuma and Chozu, wanted everyone in Japan to be united and modern. Their motto was, make the country rich, make the military strong. They made big changes, like getting rid of the old feudal system, turning domains into prefectures, and simplifying the class system. They also did land surveys, taxes, and building industries. They taught people to be loyal to the emperor to create a national identity. The Meiji Emperor and government successfully turned Japan from an old-fashioned country to a modern one. As part of modernization, Japan started using weapons, tactics, and training from the West in their military. They did this better and more successfully than China did. China's attempt to modernize with the self-strengthening movement pretty much failed after the Sino-Japanese War. During the early Meiji period, Japan cared more about developing itself rather than making friends with other Asian countries. In 1879, they took over the Ryukyu Islands, even though China didn't like it. China got nervous about Japan's influence in Korea, which they saw as their subordinate. They had some issues in 1882 and 1884, but they managed to solve them without going to war. In 1885, China and Japan agreed not to send troops to to Korea without telling each other. The Sino-Japanese War started in 1894 when the Qing helped Korea against the rebellion. Japan was notified about of Chinese troops in Korea, so they sent their own. When the rebellion was over, neither side left, and the war started. Japan's army and navy were much better, and they easily won. The peace treaty in 1895 guaranteed Korea's in independence and China gave Taiwan and a few other places to Japan. This victory changed the balance of power in East Asia, and Japan was now seen as a major military power. The Sino-Japanese War was one of the last big fights, for gunpowder was a major chemical in bullets. But then came smokeless powder, a better rifle. After this war, Everyone started using smokeless powder in armies worldwide. It became popular after the Spanish and American War in 1898 and the Boer War between 1899 and 1902. This powder left less mess, made it easier to make fast firing guns, and reduced the chance of misfires. Also, soldiers using smokeless powder didn't give away their positions with visible puffs of smoke. The Boers used, used this advantage to hide and shoot at British soldiers making the British also adopt smokeless powder. The Japanese quickly embraced it too, giving them an edge in the Russo-Japanese War between 1904 and 1905. 
China had a powerful military for centuries, being the first place of gunpowder weaponry. Even when facing attacks from, out from others with similar technology like the Jin, Mongols, Portuguese, or Dutch, China put up a strong fight. Gunpowder helped them succeed in periods of expansion and consolidation. Japan got gunpowder during the Mongol invasion in 1271 and 1281, but they only embraced guns when Portuguese merchants introduced the musket in 1543. After using it skillfully in the Battle of Nakashino, Japan soon unified and nearly conquered Korea. Although firearm use declined under, under the Tokugawa, Japan's military strength was revived with the Meiji Restoration. To conclude this video, the use of gunpowder in East Asia is a crucial part of military history. From its accidental discovery to intentional use in warfare, gunpowder forever changed how conflicts played out. 